Welcome to CRISPR Unedited, a bite-sized bio podcast hosted by Anthony Adamson. Today on CRISPR Unedited, we chat to Matthew Cobb, Professor of Zoology at the University of Manchester and popular science writer. We kick off at the very start of the genetic age back in the 1970s. The real beginning of genetic engineering, which was in, in 1972, and that's when the first series of papers were published uh, in the autumn of that year, which enabled us for the very first time to very pre- relatively precisely uh, introduce uh, genetic material from one organism to one species. From- we move on to discuss the hot topic of scientific self-regulation and safeguard development. There was a, a really pioneering conference, wasn't there, back in, was it 1975? Yeah, early 1975. So. What you've got to remember is that the, uh, this idea of mixing up uh, DNA from different organisms, from bacteria, from viruses, different kinds of viruses, uh, <clears throat> had caused great, con- great concern. And finally, we end by discussing the promise of gene editing and what the future may hold. And genetic engineering and gene editing may well be able to solve them in the ways you've suggested. Um, there are equally now uh, tomatoes on the market which are going to supply uh, particular vitamins or particular drugs and that again may be a way of getting people to accept that you know, this has, has been done. All this and more in this episode of CRISPR Unedited. So welcome to this podcast on the history of gene editing. I'm joined today by Matthew Cobb, who is a professor of zoology at the University of Manchester. Matthew, uh, thank you for joining me. Thank you very much. Great to be here. Uh, So this is quite a timely podcast for a couple of reasons. First of all, Matthew, uh, you have a book out next month, I believe, on this uh, that relates to this very topic. Yeah, it's it's quite amazing. What a coincidence. Yeah. um, So I've got a book out uh, in the UK. It's called The Genetic Age, uh, Our Perilous Quest to Edit Life. Uh, The book will be out in November. Uh, in the US, uh, confusingly under a different title, a rather more pompous one, which is nothing to do with me, called As Gods, uh, um, A Moral History of the Genetic Age. But anyway, it's the same book inside. It's got a different title and different cover. But yes, oh. that's, that, that's why I'm here, I suspect. <laughs> anyway, it sounds, sounds very dramatic in, in the US, at least. Um, and but the second reason as well for this timeliness of this podcast is it's been 10 years since the landmark CRISPR paper from Down and Chimpanzee in Science, um, which of course led to their Nobel Prize a couple of years ago in 2020. And in those 10 years, we've seen the rise of that term gene editing, which is just everywhere these days in the scientific literature. Um, but this term has been around a lot longer than that, hasn't it, Matthew? Well, yeah, I mean, it's not only the, the, the 10th anniversary of uh, Charpentier and Doudna's paper, it's the 50th anniversary of the real beginning of genetic engineering, which was in in 1972. And that's when the first series of papers were published uh, in the autumn of that year, which enabled us for the very first time to very relatively precisely uh, introduce uh, genetic material from one organism, from one species, from one whole group or from a virus into uh, another organism. And that was the, the beginning of well, what I've called the genetic age, everything that's happened subsequently, including CRISPR and future methods of base editing and all the rest, no matter what the differences in the technology, which are enormous, they can all trace themselves back to that paper or those series of papers in the autumn of 1972. And what's interesting is that from the very beginning, because this is not simply scientific work, this has always had a practical application to it or has been has been hovering in the background from the very beginning there have been concerns about safety about how we're going to use this technology much as there have been over previous technologies that have been created great anxieties from steam engines to you know the atomic power or or whatever the the genetic age is what we've been living in in the last 50 years and it's shaped not only science technology medicine but also culture uh, where would the world be without Jurassic Park? Uh, and that's, you know, so when you think of it in that way, it's not simply a matter of a series of discoveries we've made, but it's also about how those discoveries have caused concern and scientists in particular have been at the forefront of actually raising those issues. That, that's what I find particularly fascinating. Uh, 
uh, just to conclude on this, a bit of a hurrah for geneticists, you know, because scientists have done all sorts of things uh, in the past, but genetics is the only field in which scientists have taken a lead, said this experiment is very worrying. We are not going to do it for a while until certain safety protocols can be uh, implemented. And it's quite extraordinary that the physicists, for example, who are working on the Manhattan Project, they were very concerned because when the project was finally coming to its, uh, its culmination, the Germans had been defeated. And so the whole reason why they were racing to build the atomic bomb had disappeared. And yet it was still going to be used against Japan. And so many of the physicists were very unhappy about that for fairly obvious moral reasons. But they didn't actually stop work. They wrote open letter, they wrote letters, they complained, they argued, but they didn't actually stop work. And yet four times in the history of genetic engineering, uh, in 1971, in 1974, in 2012, and most recently in 2019, researchers have either argued there should be a pause on research or have actually implemented it. So I think that, in, that that's what interests, not just simply amazing technology, which is, you know, transformed all sorts of parts of our lives, affected culture, but it's also had this interaction with the, the social sphere. I, mean, I suppose in terms of that self-regulation um, from the geneticists, there was a, a really pioneering conference, wasn't there, back in, was it 1975? Yeah, early 1975. So what you've got to remember is that the uh, this idea of mixing up uh, DNA from different organisms, from bacteria, from viruses, different kinds of viruses, uh, <clears throat> had caused great, con great concern. The, the starting point was, was the work of Paul Berg, who won his Nobel Prize uh, for this in 1980. And what Berg was really interested in was trying to understand how mammalian genes work, which was vir virtually nothing was known about this at the beginning of the 1970s. We had some idea about bacteria, bacterial genes in particular, things like the LAC operon and so on. And so what he thought was, well, okay, if I, we understand how the LAC operon works and we can put it, we could put, if we could put that into a mammalian cell, into a cell line, then we could get some idea of what the cell does because it would have these instructions and we'd know what we'd expect it to do and what happens. So that was quite an interesting idea. And he was developing tools to do this a lot, along with a lot of other people in Stanford. And what he also decided to do, he had a new PhD student called Janet Mertz, and he said, OK, well, if we're going to use um, uh, SV40, which is a, a, uh, a virus that causes uh, tumours in uh, hamster cells. So it's, it's something that people were very interested because at the time, everybody, there's this very fashionable idea that um, cancer was caused by viruses, all cancers, clearly some are, but it was the idea is that, yeah, cancer is a viral disease and so they were trying to study sv40 and it infects obviously infects mammalian cells so they thought okay um we can what would happen if we put sv he was his primary interest was to use sv40 to take the lac gene and put it into uh, a human cell or a mammalian cell but he also thought for this PhD student, why don't we do the opposite experiment? Why don't we get the S, just see what happens if we get the SV40, potentially cancerous uh, gene, uh, and put it into E. coli, which is, as everybody knows, a, a gut bacteria. And when a man called Bob Pollack at uh, Cold Spring Harbor heard of this in 1971, he said, what, you're going to get a cancer causing gene and you're going to stick it into something that lives in our gut? You are crazy. And he basically said that to Berg and Berg told him to get lost and eventually thought about it a lot and then said well actually yeah it might be dangerous and I don't really care about that experiment anyway it's not really what I'm interested in so okay I won't do it so that was the first time and it was all done in private nobody knew about this but what happened is with the development of Berg's method uh, for using phage to the phage bacterium to get the whole of the e, the uh, lac operon from E. coli and then put that uh, into, a, uh, into a cell, um, very quickly, that quite cumbersome method, which he won his Nobel Prize for, what, I mean, without a matter of months, had been uh, streamlined, made more simple. Janet Mertz, his PhD student, was one time PhD student, now uh, had 
turned the system from using six complicated enzymes to only using two. So people at the time said, well, you know, any high school student could do this. I think it's a bit of an exaggeration. But what's striking is that the innovation really got, really took off. And within months of these papers being published 50 years ago, there was also the realization by Stan Cohen and Herb Boyer that they could manipulate plasmids, these weird bits of uh, circular DNA that you get in bacteria, and then use those plasmids as a way of transferring between bacteria. And that led to the idea very rapidly that, okay, you could, you could do virtually anything with this technique. And when that was published, that is what caused the initial concerns. Uh, first in 1973 at a conference when Bert Boyer, who was supposed to be not saying anything because work hadn't been published, he couldn't resist telling these young researchers, hey, I've done this amazing thing with Stan Cohen. Uh, and they all went, oh my God, you know, this is really rather alarming. And that led to the uh, American Association, uh, the American Academy of Sciences, National Academy of Sciences in the USA, setting up a, a group to think about what should happen, how they could control this technology, what should be the rules around it. And Berg was the uh, put in charge of this commission. And what they ended up with was this conference at Asilom, Asilomar, which is on the California coast. And uh, Berg chose that place because his department at Stanford regularly went up there. So it was, a, it was somewhere they knew, you know, it's, you know, it's a it's conference center on the coast, very nice. So they had this meeting of about 180 scientists, mainly from the US, but from all over the world. Uh, and it's pretty, particularly significant, as I'll explain later on, there are also some Russian researchers there, or Soviet researchers. And they thrashed out over about four days in fairly heated uh, circumstances, a bit like a really fractious student meeting, you know. So it was a lot of argument and to and fro in. And some of the, they'd had this moratorium, they'd agreed in the middle of 1974, not that nobody would work on what was now known as recombinant DNA. So DNA from more than one species. Uh, and everybody agreed, OK, we won't do this until we know how we can do it safely. And uh, at the meeting, there were I mean, the meeting was designed to re to remove the moratorium to come to, you know, there was no question, should we do this? It was simply, how can we do this? So everybody, you know, as you rightly teed this up, people praise this as an example of scientists coming to a solution, but they didn't actually question what the technology might be used for. And in particular, the whole debates are focused on safety. So. Um, David Baltimore uh, later won the no very quickly won the Nobel Prize shortly afterwards. Uh, he was the chair and he said, right, we're not going to be discussing potential commercial applications. We're not going to be discussing environmental consequences. We're not going to be discussing potential use in biological warfare. So all the kind of moral issues or political issues were taken off the agenda. And they simply said, all we know about is biosafety. How can we do this safely? So it's interesting that the, in fact, there were, there, there were very detailed discussions, but they're all about, you know, hoods and <laughs> extraction and yeah. you know, biosafety and that, you know, you, what, what PPE are you going to wear? They weren't about, hmm, this might do something bad. Uh, and I think that's that, that part of the mythology of Asilomar, because scientists love it, because, hey, we took control of this. We came up with these criteria. We then, in the US, gave them to the National Institutes of Health, which said, we won't fund anybody who doesn't use these procedures, which are basically you know, four, four levels, as everybody still knows, still uses uh, of, of biosafety. They never had the force of law. They were never put into, they didn't bizarrely apply to the private sector. So the private sector companies that very soon began in the wake of uh, the Boyer and Cohen method, uh, in particular Genentech, which was created shortly afterwards, um, they were completely exempt from these rules. They generally followed them because that was the sensible thing to do. You don't want any bad press. So that after a cinema, you get this set of rules which are going to be applied. And there is now, after you've had the meeting, a huge public row about it. I mean, it becomes an immense thing all over the world with people saying, oh my God, this is terrifying. It's going to, you know, we're all going to die. Um, <clears throat> wasn't helped by the fact that in the UK, for example, we'd had two outbreaks of smallpox 
Mm. From one from a, a, a well, both from lab leaks. One in circumstances we don't still understand, and you know people had died from this. So there were. It wasn't just craziness. You know, it was just that weird seventies thing. People were had legitimate reasons to be concerned about this, but amazingly rapidly, when it became apparent that you could do the experiment safely, that there, people weren't going to die of cancer or whatever. And also, goodness me, there was potentially an awful lot of money to be made from this. <laughs> By 1980, this kind of four year, crazy, intense debate all over the world about what regulations we should have just kind of evaporated. Uh, it was also linked to political changes. You've got to remember, you know, all this is linked up with society. It's not just scientists or biotech geniuses. Uh, this is when Thatcher comes to power in the UK. It's when Reagan comes to power in the US and deregulation, getting rid of all the, the, the red tape. Let's cut the red tape. And so this stuff, we don't need to worry about that. Let's just let it rip. You know, we've got to start making money. The whole global economy is in a state. These people, for example, Genentech, have come up with this way of making uh, insulin using uh, using effectively the, the human gene. It's the first time this could be done. They use the, the human gene. Uh, the sequence of human insulin, because up until then you had to use animal insulin, insulin which isn't exactly the same. Uh, you had to get it out of calves. Hard to come by as well, I imagine. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you, well, there are a lot of calves die, so you get, you know, it was a byproduct of the meat industry. Basically, you get the pancreas, lob it out, send it off to the lab, that then kind of isolates it. But now you can make this stuff in vats, and it was better in a way than the uh, the previous version. Not necessarily cheaper though. Well, it was supposed to be, uh, but bizarre, you know, this is one of the things, I mean, it's because it's not simply a matter of scale. It's also in particular, as we know, in the US, it's the, uh, the way that uh, drugs are priced. Mm. And yeah, so we've seen this in particular, it should be the case, because it's relatively straightforward to produce, that this uh, insulin should be as cheap as chips. But, you know, in particular in the US, it's crazy, crazy prices. I mean, and that this whole, you, can, you can see, just to finish on this, this whole period closes with the two symbols in 1980 on the same day uh paul berg wins his nobel prize basically for inventing genetic engineering or for making it turn it into a reality and genentech uh is put on the uh it goes public and goes on to wall street and herb boyer uh becomes a multimillionaire wow. <laughs> overnight uh because you know everybody this is just before apple uh, goes public. It's the first of the real excitement about biotech. Yeah, we can, a lot of speculation uh, and an immense, it was the biggest launch, the most successful launch that, at the time that Wall Street had ever seen. So you've got the, the commercial wing and the academic wing kind of, in, the, in fact, they were on the same page of the San Francisco, front page of the San Francisco uh, Chronicle. Uh, you had Paul Berg winning his Nobel Prize and, you know, Genentech takes Wall Street by storm or whatever the headline was. I, mean, I just think it's fascinating to hear the history of this because there'll be so many people that listen to this podcast that might work in a lab and for them working plasmids is just routine you know they're yeah. making them day in day out they're ordering from companies and to hear the background where there was so much controversy and fear you know it, it, it's a really interesting way to view what we do on a day-to-day -day basis and how things progressed all the time yeah. and you mentioned you know, you know about these fears obviously the the same kind of fears have always been around about gene editing as well, about CRISPR-Cas9, about what are people going to do with it. That concept of regulation I find really interesting because an analogy I often use is um, if I were to go and do an experiment that involved radioactivity, I can't order that radioactive material to my home address. I, I, I can't do that, obviously. You need to work in an institution that's got approvals in place, necessary health and safety. With CRISPR-Cas9, I'm not totally certain that's the case right now. Maybe oh, no. it could be because, you know, these days companies have just, you know, jumped on the bandwagon as well with CRISPR. And there's so many commercial products out there. It's made my life much easier as a, as a scientist. But should we be regulating that supply, that, you know, controlling who can buy these things? Well, there, there is a kind of regulation. So, again, this is when it all interacts with, uh, with politics again. So I said that at... Uh, at Asilomar, they didn't discuss, they wouldn't discuss uh, genetic, wouldn't discuss bioweapons, although Baltimore said this is potentially the most significant and terrifying application here, but we're not going to talk about it. One of the reasons for that is that um, uh, Nixon in 1969, President Nixon had just out of the blue said, okay, we're destroying all our stocks of traditional 
biological weapons. I mean, they didn't destroy all of them. They never do. Uh, but, you know, we're, we're, we're not going to we're not going to develop anything new. We'll be fine just with anthrax or whatever they had developed, you know. Um, but that meant there was no active program of developing uh, bioweapons in America. So I think the Americans could feel, well, actually, you know, maybe the politicians have sorted this out. It turns out that the five person Soviet delegation, which was composed of uh, people who were kind of ridiculed by the <clears throat> young bucks of American molecular genetics. There were all these old guys in their 60s uh, who just didn't know anything. Three of them had been involved in a decision taken two years earlier in the Soviet Union to develop uh, an active bioweapons program. Wow. And they were actively developing. So they were there pretending to be these kind of ninnies who didn't understand anything. But in fact, they knew perfectly well how this could be used. And uh, for complex reasons, uh, partly because this was a way of getting money for molecular genetics in the Soviet Union, they said to Brezhnev, right, we will build you new bioweapons. We will fuse, you know, new microbes, uh, microbes and viruses together to make terrifying weapons. It took a long time, but by uh, the middle of the 80s, they'd actually succeeded and they were developing very worrying new weapons. All this became apparent when there were a series of defectors in the 1980s and uh, eventually the collapse of the Soviet Union. Uh, the West now knew exactly what had been going on. There were books published. I mean, I, you know, I, I just noticed that these guys were at the, who these guys were, who were at Asilomar. Um, the actual groundwork of discovering all this has been done by either defectors or by uh, academics interested in Soviet history. And that meant that when people now became very alarmed because uh, just as with nuclear weapons, after the collapse of the Soviet Union, there were all these bioweapons, because there were, there were thousands and thousands of researchers all over the Soviet Union who'd been developing this, either to kill people or to kill plants and animals. There were two kind of wings to this project. So you, the West then gets very, very alarmed about uh, what if these uh, techniques fall into the wrong hands? I mean, so it could be rogue states, terrorists, and then, of course, with 9-11, the, at the beginning of the century, uh, the US in particular becomes absolutely terrified. There were, it wasn't only that 9-11, 9-11, <laughs> younger listeners may not remember, well, no, 9-11 was followed virtually immediately by a series of uh, envelopes containing anthrax that were sent around to various people in the, in the, in the USA, the, to the center of the, the capital in Washington and so on. A number of people died by inhaling, you know, they opened the envelope and the spores come out. So there's a kind of real fear about bioterrorism. The letters were accompanied by Islamist rhetoric, but immediately the security services, I don't know how, spotted that this, this was just kind of, this, this wasn't real, it was somebody else. Almost certainly it was a, an, a, an American scientist who commis, committed sign, uh, suicide before he could be charged. But this meant that in the US, you now had this growing concern about uh, potential bioterrorism. There was the development of the first gain of function studies. So people were starting to reconstruct or develop viruses because they thought it was interesting. I mean, it's first done completely by accident. They discovered that uh, they were trying, some Australian researchers were trying to uh, make uh, mice susceptible because mice can be a terrible problem in Australia where there are a lot of marsupials they're invasive species and they were trying to find a bioweapon against the mice and they were working on something called mouse pox and they discovered that they had inadvertently made a strain of uh, mouse pox that would not be affected by uh, vaccines and mouse pox as the name kind of might indicate is very similar to smallpox mm -hmm. so these guys in australia were absolutely terrified they had inadvertently stumbled upon a way of making smallpox resistant to uh, vaccines so you you start to get the development also of the various uh, mini pandemics of the, the you know the spillover events uh, that are occurring in china and in the middle east there's MERS, there's sars and so the world is starting 15 years ago to start and get very antsy about this could all be weaponized. You get the development of synthetic biology, hacker culture, the idea that we can do this in our basement. And as you say, you can just order stuff. You know, so journalists would order over the 
over the internet bits of the, the smallpox virus sequence and they just get it in the post. You know, you send it to your home. So what the US government started to do in particular and the UK is to have uh, systems whereby companies were supposed to be screening the sequences. You know, what exactly are you asking? You see, you know, you know, a little paperclip will pop, pop up and said, you seem to be ordering a bioweapon. Do you really want to do this? Or you'd get men in black and, you know, black glasses charging into your door. But as the example of the journalist in London shows, you can actually order the bits and then assemble it, you know, if you're clever or not particularly clever. You know, I mean, what's striking is that after the US invaded uh, Afghanistan after 9-11, they uh, they found lots of documents written by the written by the Al Qaeda leadership, and one of them said, "Yeah, the West keeps on saying that this bioweapon stuff is really easy. We should try it." <laughs> now they didn't succeed, but actually it was all the rhetoric about God. This is amazing. This is amazingly simple. People can use this to attack us. You know, we must control this. And the terrorists took notice and they tried, but it turned out to be more complicated. So yeah, there is a, this real concern that has been going on. In particular, it's been, it, you know, it, it was 9-11 that really kind of kick-started it, the development of the, the, the recognition that there were potential new bioweapons that could be created by this relatively straightforward technology. And that then kind of feeds into the whole political and economic funding of research and researchers are guided into gain of function studies. And that in 2012 leads to them suddenly going, well, crikey, we've now made these viruses, you know, for example, bird flu. They'd made it, they deliberately made it transmissible through the air, which just seems, you know, by re respiration. Which, you know, why on earth would you do that? And the argument they have is, OK, well, this will enable us to understand future pandemics. Uh, well, you know, I there's an argument about this, but my yeah. personal view is, well, you know, COVID shows that it didn't actually help. No, absolutely <laughs> not. Because although molecular genetics has helped, has enabled us to beat it, it didn't enable us to predict what it was going to do or in any way. Before. But there is a big argument by this, I recognise. But the main thing is that just as in the 70s and 80s, people who weren't trained in basic micro microbiological techniques flooded into the area to start, you know, making new, uh, putting human genes into microbes and creating new drugs. The same thing happened 20 years ago is that lots of people could get now get funding for doing research on these mi microbes, but didn't necessarily have the training to do so safely. And that has been continued, the continual argument thus far. Nothing bad has happened. But, you know, I think that's a matter of luck. <laughs> well, I hope that continues. I, mean, I want to move away from you know, some Sorry, of the yeah. perils we've been talking about, obviously. Um, and talk about some of the promise, because obviously yeah, we are in a, in a revolutionary era. Um, gene editing is not a new technology, and you know, we, we can track the development of gene editing from recombinant DNA technology. In the early 90s, we saw Maria Jason's landmark studies on meganucleases, first time demonstrating that if you generate a break in the DNA within a mammalian cell, then you can exploit the repair pathways that follow and make changes. And of course, then we had um, uh, zinc fingers, Talons, and it was really CRISPR Cas9 that has democratized gene editing because it's yeah. so easy to use. Where do you see the future of gene editing? Um, because from speaking my perspective as a laboratory scientist, it's totally revolutionized how we approach research and the things we can do these days. But are we just still scratching the surface? Um, well, I think as a, as a technique for discovery, uh, this is, I don't think you could imagine much better is i mean that you know, obviously people are always fiddling around with it and making the the the, the guide rna is more accurate and all the rest of it but as a research tool then this is i mean you know you, your imagination literally is is the limit the problem is the issue comes as, as always with these things is well how are you then going to turn that into an application either as a reliable therapy a reliable uh, technology that you could put into the fields uh, or as some people wish to do as a reliable technology you could then release into the wild either in terms of altering populations or 
uh, you know, de-extincting the, the, the big fantasy. Now, my, my own view is that the, the, the devil is always in the detail. And, you know, the science fiction of idea, okay, we can resurrect a, a mammoth, fairly quickly kind of collapses under the weight of the actual <laughs> immense technical genetic problems there are with doing that. On the other hand, curing diseases, I think there is, if it can be made safe, I mean, this is the problem. So, you know, genetic gene therapy has been around since before um, Paul Berg's experiment. So the earliest attempts to try and use genes to cure genetic diseases were, were done in 1970 and then again in 1980. So these were, they didn't work, uh, but these were attempts to try and solve genetic problems in, in humans. And there have been some remarkable successes, but the technology has been limited because, for example, uh, with the, you know, dealing with the bubble boy disease, SCA, SCID or SCID, however you want to pronounce it, um, this could be resolved, but only by using vectors carrying the new gene that you couldn't control the insertion of. And this led to some patients being cured other patients being cured and then developing leukemia because the gene had gone, you know, the, the, the payload had been put in the wrong place and had inadvertently or turned out that the, the vector actually wanted to hit a particular target. And that target in some uh, people turned out to be this gene that if mutated would cause leukemia. So you've got this. Is, is that word control though? I mean, you know, the word use and control. Because when you think of the term gene editing, when you say editing something, oh, yeah. it's like you're making a deliberate change. It's, you know, you like you precisely know what the outcome well, is going to be. That's it. Yeah. And are we have we got the precision? I, I would argue probably not at this point in time. Yeah. Like like you say, it will improve. But yeah. have we got that precision? Well, that's the no. Clearly, we haven't. I mean, we haven't enough. I mean, and, and as this morning you retweeted and I I retweeted uh, even the apparently safer base editing techniques, which are very exciting, could resolve, you know, single nucleotide diseases uh, like sickle cell disease. I mean, you know, so there are, there, are, there are tremendous potential applications here. And you just, you read the paper and you start and you go, crikey, that, that's amazing, this can work. You know, we could alter a single base pair uh, and therefore cure somebody in, without getting into any worries about uh, germline editing, which would be done uh, in, uh, in somatic cells and you'd re-inject, you know, do them ex vivo, you'd then re-inject them and fantastic, you can now, you know, cure somebody. And there are individuals who have gone, undergone experimental procedures. I think that's always the emphasis. This is experimental. People have incredibly bravely, you know, they are literally being a guinea pig and allowing them so their bodies to be used to understand. But the problem is, you know, the off target effects that, uh, I mean, I explain this to students that depending on, you know, with ordinary CRISPR, depending on when it, what, the state of the cell cycle, when you do it, it can have completely catastrophic effects sometimes. You, know, you, you can lose whole chromosomes. I recently got that. So I talked to the students about this, our, our first and second year students. And one student wrote in his response or her responses, I don't understand. Cobb went on about off target effects, but my lecturers never talk about that. It just seems to be really simple, which is true. And of course, both are true from an experimental, from a scientific point of view. I mean, to be brutal, you know, if your mouse has got some off target effects and it doesn't actually affect the gene you're interested in, then who cares, you know? Yeah. Uh, but if you're wanting to <laughs> edit some cells that you're then going to stick in your body, you don't want anything, you know, to be dangerous. So this is, I think, this is, this is the worry, that we need to be absolutely confident that the techniques we're going to be doing, uh, using, which are potentially life-transforming, assuming that they can be delivered to everybody who needs it and not only to the rich, because there's also a fundamental issue of health inequalities, this absolutely highlights. We're back to the whole thing that, you know, science and medicine don't take place in a vacuum. They're all linked up with society. And so, you know, who will benefit from this? How will they benefit? But if those uh, bio essential safety issues can be overcome or the risk is so low that as a society and as individuals, we're prepared to uh, accept those risks because, you know, lots of every time you have a general anesthetic it's risky but yeah. we accept that risk so it doesn't have to be a hundred percent i don't think but people have got we 
as a society have to accept those risks if there are any. Uh, then, yeah, this can be absolutely transformational, not just as uh, a way of altering various laboratory organisms or non-laboratory organisms. So as a zoologist, you know, I was one of the, my favorite CRISPR paper from the early wave of excitement was two papers on ants in, in cell. Now, that's the first research. And I think it's the only research paper cell has ever published on ants. But it was astonishing because it showed that, you know, if you knew a gene, uh, you could then manipulate it and you can deliver the, 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 the CRISPR constructs to the cells that you're interested in, uh, then you can change virtually any organism. And that, from a laboratory point of view, is fantastic. I think in terms of applications in the field, literally the fields, so, uh, you know, one of the most astonishing... So in writing this book, there's lots of stuff I didn't... Most of the stuff I didn't know about before I started writing it. And the astonishing success and problems associated with GM crops was one of the things I found most interesting. The, 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 the research by Mary Del Chilton and others who enabled us in the 80s to be able to manipulate plants. Uh, and then the development of uh, the two principal GM crops we have around the world one of which is BT, which enables, makes the plant now, it produces a natural insecticide. And that has been astonishing in terms of the reduction in the amount of insecticide that's been chucked around the planet. So whatever your problems you may or may not have about GM crops, that simple fact is a good thing. Uh, and that was, I mean, so Monsanto, which no longer exists, so I'm not a Monsanto shill because there's nobody to give me money, right? Uh, but what I was fascinated to discover that Monsanto develops that idea when, virtually as soon as the genetic engineering of plants becomes possible in order, as they said, we've got to get out of pesticides, get out of chemicals. They, at that time, argued this is not a sustainable system because they produced, you know, uh, they produced napalm, uh, they, they produced, uh, you know, synthetic grass, astroturf. So, you know, everything that was artificial, they were doing. And as a company, they said, right, this isn't sustainable. We've got to change this. We need to develop smart ways of increasing crop production. On the other hand, they very quickly came up with the idea of um, also use, making herbicide tolerant crops. So their, potent, their, their uh, insectis, their herbicide glyphosate, they discovered in one of the waste pipes of one of their factories, a bacterium that was growing there that could resist the effects of uh, glyphosate. So they then- Take the gene out of that. Took that gene, yeah, stuck yeah. it into the plants. Hey, presto, we can now spray this mm. uh, herbicide everywhere, kill all your weeds and your corn or whatever will carry on growing. Fantastic. Except, you know, uh, evolution is smarter than we are. And it's smarter than we are with B BT uh, crops as well. And you start to get resistant strains, et cetera, et cetera. And so I was amazed by the ingenuity uh, very surprised by the initial motivation from Monsanto researchers, and then also kind of slightly depressed when I discovered that the overall, the consequences of all this ingenuity and technology for productivity of crops has been no change. <laughs> so, it, you know, we have done an amazing stuff, uh, and it is astonishing, and there are potentials there, but for the moment, it hasn't actually transformed. And part of the reason agriculture globally, well, it's changed it, but it hasn't transformed. It. Part of the reason for this is that the it's all been all this research has been done on particular strains of wheat or whatever, uh, you know, maize, and those aren't necessarily the best for all circumstances. And this is one of the reasons, in a nutshell, why it hasn't, despite the dreams of some uh, some donors and so on, hasn't transformed agriculture in Africa because. You know, Africa is a continent, not a country, and has many different ecologies and systems and ways of working. Uh, and equally in China, so fine, I'll say on this, the, the most extraordinary thing I discovered was that, so GM crops we know 20 years ago were a real concern to people. I think largely because of things that had nothing to do with GM crops. <laughs> so this was the epoch of the, the mad cow disease where but nothing, nothing to do with genetics at all, but people became worried about food. And then there's this idea of this new food, which we're gonna use. And this food is 
got some gene from another species in it and it's the other stuff floating around in there too uh and oh i don't like the fan, don't like the sound of that so this there's this general concern with you know it's, there was the millenn millennial panic about all sorts of things you know, about uh bioterrorists about gm crops and a lot of that has faded now but partly because uh in in europe and that's still the uk despite brexit uh there are no gm crops in the immediate human uh, uh, chain, food chain. So we don't, we can't eat GM crops in Europe, but we do eat animals that have been fed on GM maize or whatever. And in America, in the US, uh, it's in the food everywhere. And you don't know because you're not allowed to explicitly label saying this was not made with GM crops. That's for some reason, you're not allowed to, the consumers aren't given that information in the US. There's um, a technical difference here, though, isn't there, between GM crops and gene editing crops? Well, that is the hope. So in the idea, and China has been one of the main powerhouses, this is one of the things that is really striking. It's just as China's come to dominate the world economy. It has been the driving force in many areas of the application of genetic engineering. It was the first country to, ha to grow a GM crop, GM tobacco which the Americans back in the 90s said, uh, we're not going to take this. Uh, this ta we're not going to buy your tobacco crop because it's got GM and it might be dangerous. <laughs> uh, there you go. Uh, and in an indication of what has changed, China said, OK, we won't we won't grow it anymore. Um, that, you know, that would never happen now. So China has been right from the outset very interested in developing uh, G uh, gene therapies for humans, in developing new GM crops. But when it comes to food, when it comes to rice, there's been a huge yeah. argument and rouse. And I was amazed to discover that, for example, Greenpeace is relatively free to organize in China against GM crops. So they have campaigns, there are demonstrations, people, you know, and the reason for this is that it's not only the population that's not certain about this. It's also the, the, the Chinese army, leading figures in the Chinese army, I think it's all a plot, a Western plot to make us all sterile. So the, the same kind of fantasies are floating about. Now, the idea is, of course, that, OK, if we can gene edit, we can simply change one or two bases and all of the, the apparatus that we've used to make those changes is then metabolized by the cells and disappears. So literally you have got exactly the same result as you would have done by traditional mutation, selective breeding, which is how all our crops are produced, then why, why should anybody complain? Well, there's a really interesting story here about, about the humble tomato, isn't there? Where, you know, essentially the domestication of tomato to make it agriculturally um, uh, relevant, you know, big fruits and large plants has destroyed its taste. Yeah. And essentially these are made by bombarding plants with radiation or chemicals and creating like 20,000 mutations in a single generation and then seeing what sticks, what, what's yeah. good here. And I think it was a Chinese group actually a few years ago published a paper in Nature Biotechnology where they went back to the wild tomato and then rebuilt the good meat bottle. They said, you know, the mutations, the agriculture, <laughs> you know, relevant mutations in the wild tomato. And so therefore you maintain the flavor, you maintain the natural, you know, um, uh, vitamin content of the tomato. But at the same time, you gave it those agriculturally relevant characteristics as well. So there it's a great area here because obviously you're only giving those tomatoes something that's already known, something that's been yeah, tried and absolutely. tested. Absolutely. So I think I think that's I mean what that indicates is actually with 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 agriculture, and it's clearly that psychologically there's something odd going on here. So let's go back to the example of uh insulin. You know, everybody who has diabetes and takes insulin is consuming a GM or using a GM product and actually injecting it into their veins. And that doesn't seem to worry anybody. Now, it might be because they don't know, probably don't, it might be because there's no alternative and there isn't really, or it might be because they just assume, well, medics know best and anyway, this saves my life. But there is not the same anxiety as can be found with somebody going, oh, I'm not going to eat this thing. It's weird. It's you know, Franken food or whatever. But part of the issue with all that is actually behind in the whole agricultural industry is that it is that is that it's, you know, the GM crops we have have been designed to fit the industry. It's not the other way around. It's yeah. the mass agriculture we've got. It's the spraying of herbicides everywhere. It's the use of these very fast growing, big, 
plants that may not actually taste of much, which have been designed to meet our desire for cheaper food. Uh, so, you know, we're not, we're not, we as a population are not outside of this, we're part of it, you know, and I think there are deeper problems and genetic engineering and gene editing may well be able to solve them in the ways you've suggested. Um, there are equally now uh, tomatoes on the market, which are going to supply uh, particular vitamins or particular drugs. And that, again, may be a way of getting people to accept that, you know, this has, has been done. It is, I mean, often the editing and scissors metaphors we use are wrong for the reasons we've explained. But I think that in some of these cases, it is actually true. It is simply the base pairs that have been altered and you've got the same result as you would have got by random mutation and the incredibly labor intensive ways we've been making plants for the last 50 years, which have fed the planet, you know, the mm -hmm. green revolution has been extraordinary. That well, has of course, been... with uh, with climate change, well, there are some people saying, you know, rather than rather than the argument, let's slow down climate change. People are saying, let's adapt our crops to accommodate. Uh, uh, well, we're going to have to because you know, things are the weather's changing, so we're going to need crops that can resist desiccation. Uh, you know, periods of uh, long periods of drought, and there are genes around that do that. And so, I think those kind of ways uh, maybe. A way of, yeah, I mean, it's very interesting. The Chinese researchers who are involved in this are very insistent that there isn't going to be a magic bullet. And I think we've always got to tell us, okay, we can all do this. And it's going to be, uh, you know, new, new plants to meet climate change, to meet new medical needs, or simply to increase varieties are going to come about through a whole series of ways, you know, selective breeding, mutation, gene editing, and we're going to have to need all those different techniques. But this is this is very real, I think, uh, in terms of what the future holds. And it, it, it's not kind of fantasies about making photosynthesis more effective. I mean, you know, you, you don't need to. That may happen. But, you know, there are more immediate ways of altering our plants to make them resist. Climate change, disease, it's very striking. There's only a handful of GM crops resist disease. It's very odd. And I, I, I generally don't know whether this is because it's hellish, difficult or because there's not as much money in it. Uh, and, you know, we're caught up in a, a system which is both extraordinary. There are things I'm worried about. I mean, we talked at the beginning about anxieties and what I'm fascinated by is that those anxieties keep on recurring. Uh, I am worried about some things, but they are to do with the edge of this technology. Uh, and it's not GM crops, it's uh, you know, gain of function studies, which I'm concerned about. It's not editing of cure disease. It's the what we have already seen with her John Key. It's the use of, it's the, the pointless, I would argue, uh, embryo editing, germline editing. There's no need to do that. It's just it would only benefit, even, they all now admit, all the various research groups and ethical groups, that this would only benefit a few, you know, a tiny minority, literally a few hundred people around the world could benefit from that. And finally, it's a great it's, example of self-regulation, though, isn't it? Because yeah, it's absolutely. a terrible incident there, but straight yeah. away, the, the, uh, the, the Royal Academy, I believe, um, um, and the National um, um, uh, NIH, NIH got together, posed a report saying this is not good, you know, so that yeah. self-regulation came into practice yeah. straight yeah. away. Yeah. And this, the, the final element, which we haven't talked about at all, but I kind of vaguely hinted at, is the idea of gene drives. So this is releasing self-replicating, uh, rapidly exploding uh, genes into pest populations, say mosquitoes, uh, which on the one hand looks like, well, why wouldn't you want to do that? Because you can get rid of mosquitoes in a malaria-ridden area, but, you know, mosquitoes move. <laughs> and so, the, but again, the scientists involved have been the first people to say, hey, this is scary. I mean, the first publication of actually showing it worked, uh, talked to uh, basically use the same language of saying we've created a genetic bomb, which they had, uh, you know, this is a, so I think, I don't think there's any reason to be complacent. Um, I think there's lots of reasons to be excited, but like any technology, uh, you've got to develop the the, the the regulation around it i mean let's go back to the railways you know the railways changed the world and were uh, both terrifying and very you know create great anxieties lots of victorian novels about railways 
and they ended up with a system which is pretty safe. I mean, we do have railway accidents, but as, as railway workers say, that the, the safety regulations are written in blood because there were accidents. And so they learned about how to make the signal safer or whatever. Um, we've got to avoid that, I think, with genetic engineering. We haven't had that kind of accident. There hasn't been anything terrible has happened yet, apart from a junkie. Um, but there's been nothing on a mass scale and let's keep it that way. But the way you do that is by being worried and not by dismissing concerns as, okay, what's well, the same arguments as ever? How do they apply to these new developments? How can we ensure that there is effective regulation and also uh, exploitation, development of new therapies, foods, scientific discoveries, whatever it is, uh, within a framework that we can employ safely? Matthew, it's been absolutely fascinating. Um, I think oh. that's the end there. But what a <laughs> wonderful great. conversation today. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you very much. I, I hope listeners have found it interesting. You've been listening to CRISPR Unedited. To access more thoughts, help, and advice on CRISPR, visit bitesizebio.com forward slash CRISPR unedited.